So for my talk, I'll be talking some about what about medications, supplements, vitamins, and those. this is for those of us who are not so optimistic about how many Vicanimo, uh neurons that we have in our brain. So for the rest of us who maybe don't have the luck to have the, the good kind of neurons, what other su supplements, medications, other things can we do to try to help protect our memory? And so this is a common area that I get asked about every time we do a talk, every time I go to a clinic. It's a common thing because we all want to work together to try to help improve our memory and do what we can um, to advance our, our, our thinking abilities long term. So because I'm talking about medicines, I also want to make sure that you know that I, I don't have, so there, I, my funding is from the VA, from NIH, some other Alzheimer's associations, from family support. Um, we do have one study that's co-sponsored by NIH and Lilly, but again, I don't have any kickbacks from any medications, so um, I'm, I'm free and clear of that. So. So again, I think a lot of us will have questions like this. So it's very, very common, no matter where I go, can you tell me what are your thoughts on blank, so again, jellyfish extract, statins, what do you think about cognitive activities, which are the best ones to do? What about coconut oil, curcumin, crossword puzzles, do I have to do a certain kind of crossword puzzles? I don't like crossword puzzles, do I have to do them? <laughs> so there's all kinds of things and we're all earnestly trying to figure out what's the best way to help protect our minds. And so these are common, common questions that we have and it's hard to tease through what we see in the newspapers. So the newspapers, the TV, you'll hear words from other you know, people telling you stories about this worked for me. And so it's very, very hard to um, tease through this information. It's hard for us as scientists. So we applaud you for being here because we view part of our job is to kind of tease through all this information out there and try to tell you what the truth is. Um, I'm gonna tell you the bad news first is that there's nothing proven to prevent Alzheimer's disease. So we'll get that out there right now. There's nothing proven to prevent Alzheimer's disease, no medications, supplements, or vitamins. But there's some very promising leads that we're gonna go through now. So I've put out the bad news, so now we get to talk about some promising areas. So this just goes back a little bit to um, what Dr. Rogalski talked about. So this is not an MRI scan, but a picture of a brain. So the brain on top is a person who passed away without Alzheimer's disease. And in the bottom, you can see the brain of someone who passed away with Alzheimer's disease. And you can see some of that shrinkage or atrophy in the bottom picture there. So if we, um, let's see if I can use this correctly. So if we look up close under the microscope, at um, a picture of a, of a person who died without Alzheimer's disease, we can see that the brain cells or neurons, the purple um, figures there, are, are healthy looking, they're full. They have those connections, those kind of little wispy strings that go out to connect to the other neurons. And so they communicate with each other across that tannish tissue there to talk to each other. So again, they communicate with these chemical signals across there. And then you can see that tannish area in the picture is just the healthy brain tissue that the nerves kind of rest in. So if you look instead at someone who has Alzheimer's disease, let's see where I'm supposed to aim this, maybe I'll just do this. So if you look at someone who has Alzheimer's disease, instead you'll have these nerve cells that have these deposits in between made up of amyloid, these amyloid plaques that a lot of us hear about. So again, they're different than the plaques you have in your teeth or the plaques you have in your heart. They're, that's just a term that we use for a buildup of substance. So again, in Alzheimer's disease, you get amyloid deposited in between these brain cells and it causes inflammation and irritation of the cells. And then you get buildup inside the nerve cells of a protein called tau. So when we talk about protein buildup, it's not regular protein like you'd get in eating foods that have proteins. This is a specific types of proteins, amyloid outside the nerve cells and then tau inside the nerve cells. So as we talk about what medicines and vitamins and those things are doing, that, that's important because these are the, some of the key things we think are triggering um, symptoms related to Alzheimer's disease. So this is a, um, a summary of all the medicines we have available currently to treat Alzheimer's disease. And this is the same list of medicines we've had for 15 years. This is why we need all of you, and thank you for being here, because it's a true partnership to try to get, make advances in this area. Um, I, I want a new slide. I want something exciting to show that we've made some great advances. So again, Aricept, or it's called Tenepazil, Ribostigmine, or Exelon, Galantamine, or Razodyne. These are medicines that we use commonly in Alzheimer's disease to help slow progression. Commonly, we'll also, if someone does progress despite those, uh, we'll add something called memantine or nemenda is another type of medication. 
So the ones on the top, those three all work about the same. There's one on the bottom there that, that works a little differently. But overall, how they work is that they're trying to, what I just made show up there is, so again, th what they're trying to do is help improve the chemical signal across those nerves. So basically they're helping the nerves to communicate with each other longer, but they're not really doing anything to the amyloid or tau buildup that's causing the damage to begin with or inflammation. So again, with newer therapies, what we're trying to do is to block out those plaque buildup and then also block out that tau buildup. So trying to get rid of that. And that's what a lot of newer therapies are focusing on. So first I'm gonna talk about medications. And so by calling them medications, these are ones you'd have to get from a prescription um, through a physician. And again, these are not yet available. But again, some of the areas that are being studied are immune therapies that help clear that amyloid from the brain. So there's some studies going on, some of them right here in Madison, trying to look at some of these medicines. Whenever they have a, a MAB at the end, it means it's an antibody. So there's, there's um, solanuzumab, carnuzumab, this, this number, the BAN2401, that's one that hit the news this summer. There's a lot of press about that one. Um, and then there's the, um, now I can't read my own, the, what it, the letter is, but aducanumab. So you can see the, the number, the code they use for it there. So again, a lot of therapies are trying to basically um, clear the amyloid from the brain. Other therapies try to reduce the amyloid being made in the brain to begin with or to prevent it from clumping and forming those deposits that cause irritation. And then some other therapies are trying to prevent abnormal tau changes. These examples listed here, these are some diabetes medications that are out being used for diabetes now. So there are a lot of therapies that are trying to look at and, and what we call repurpose them to say, well, we know for example, carvedilol can be used for heart changes or for blood pressure. We know that some of these diabetes medicines can be used to treat diabetes. Do they help us prevent Alzheimer's? We don't know yet, but they're being studied. We're also looking at other things besides just the amyloid and tau. Again, we're not trying not to put all of our hope in one therapy, so we're trying to look not only just at the amyloid and the tau, but also some other therapies. So, um, and when I say we, I mean us as a field, um, so medications to help improve, chem improve chemical signaling, medications that help reduce inflammation, so that would be great. They have done some studies using things like ibuprofen and prednisone, things that we know reduce inflammation, and that hasn't helped protect memory yet, but they're looking at other therapies too. Other therapies that might help improve the um, glucose or sugar balance in our brains, and also therapies that help improve blood flow. Um, this is another type of blood pressure medicine. Unfortunately, I think they just came out to show it didn't have as much of an effect on thinking abilities, but it's one that's being studied, so th those results aren't out yet. So again, there's a lot of different approaches that are being taken to evaluate. Um, and so again, while none of these are proven yet, they're trying to look at a lot of different avenues, which is encouraging. But this is where we're trying to work together and partner with people to figure out what are these best therapies. Well, there are some good news. So, this study, the Sprint Mind study, came out this summer, preliminary results. So again, the final paper hasn't been published yet, so that will come, and we'll get more feedback to you on that. But what's encouraging is that this study, it started with 9,000 people. Um, most of them were, were over age uh, 50, I believe, but a lot of them were over age 75. A third of the people in the study were African American, 10% were Latino American. And so what they did is they looked at a subset of people, 2,800 people, so that's a lot of people, and they looked to see how about if we control blood pressure better. So blood pressure is something a lot of us are familiar with, and we know we should care about it, but sometimes it's hard to care about it when it just seems like a number, a random number. What they found is that if they treated people to get that top number, the, the systolic blood pressure down to less than 120, and then they compared it to people who had it less than 140, that the people who got their blood pressure down to that less than 120 did a lot better. So they used medications, two or three medications, and these are common ones that are, many of you may be on. So thiazide diuretics like hydrochlorothiazide, um, ACE inhibitors like lisinopril, um, calcium channel blockers like amlodipine. So they used medications that commonly are prescribed and, and they just tried to make sure their blood pressure was really well controlled. And so look, they got 19% reduced number of people who developed mild cognitive impairment, and combining mild cognitive impairment and dementia was reduced by 15%. So this is one of the most positive studies we've had for a long time. So 
this is my main message for you today. If you want to take home one key point from this part of the talk, if you want to focus on taking a pill, because again, I, I agree, I think that sometimes exercise and the lifestyle changes are harder to do than just taking a pill, take that blood pressure pill, get a blood pressure cuff, and know what your blood pressure is. Get to that 120 goal. It'll at least protect you from getting a heart attack and stroke. We think it might help protect against dementia too. So that's my take home point. Know your blood pressure and try to get that top number down less than 120. This is another study we're doing where this is a, a medication, it's a fish oil, but it's a prescription fish oil that's um, been shown to reduce cholesterol. But now we're trying to see, can we use this prescription fish oil to change some of those things? Can it reduce some of the inflammation, help with brain blood flow, help reduce some of that amyloid buildup that we've, we've talked about? And so this study is, is, we have enrolling still, and this is open for veterans who are eligible for the VA. Now let's move on from talking about medicine. So again, for medicines, I would put my money right now on blood pressure control until we know the other study results. What about all these other therapies that people, we've, we've heard about blueberries that people ask, Dr. Rogalski from her patients, um, coconut, we've heard about the MIND diet, um, red wine or martinis. I don't see martinis on this list though. So. <laughs> um, but there's a lot of different therapies and or a lot of different types of potential extracts or supplements that are listed here. How many people were here last year when Dr. Martha Claire Morris came? So, so hand, not a lot of people here. So last year, so Dr. Uh, Martha Claire Morris is an expert on trying to help us understand, can we, do we have to eat things in the food or can we get them, you know, synthesized down to a pill? Because I think a lot of us, I don't know if you're wired like me, but it's just easier to take a pill than to have to plan out your whole meal and make sure you get all the green leafy vegetables and all that in there. So again, but again, what she found is that, and she's the one who's developed the MIND diet, which is a mix of Mediterranean diet with a diet called the DASH diet. And the DASH diet, its goal is to help control high blood pressure. So her study really is combining some things that we know that help protect our heart um, and will probably help protect our brain as well. So as far as taking these supplements, again, supplements do sometimes have side effects. I would make sure that if you decide to take them, one, they don't cost very much and that you talk with your doctor before you take them. But even more so, I'd advocate trying to get uh, um, these naturally through um, food sources. What about combining all these wonderful things? So if we could just take all those ingredients on there, just put them into one big soup or a big slushy or something. And that's what they've tried to do here with, um, so there's a, a food um, micronutrient combination, so Suvenade, um, and there's other combination therapies too where they're trying to pull together all these things and make a big slush and see if that'll help with our brain and thinking abilities. And unfortunately, there, there again, a study was just um, released recently that didn't show that taking that combination in a supplement form made a difference in cognitive performance or changes to develop dementia. So again, getting back to good diet, um, blood pressure control, those things that we, we wish it was something fancier, but again, good blood pressure control and diet is probably the best bet we have right now. This is another study, the Finnish geriatric study, or they call it finger study, to prevent cognitive impairment. And this showed a different combination of factors. So they pulled together some things that Dr. Mueller will be talking about next, cognitive training, but also diet, exercise, and vascular risk monitoring. And they did see improved cognitive performance. So again, it gets back to some of these heart healthy things that sometimes are hard for us to kind of step up and take care of, but those are the things that may help us in our cognitive function the most. So what can I do now? So that's what a lot of times we're coming here to find out. Where are we with our science? What can I do right now to help protect my brain? So this is not proven. This is Cindy Carlson's interpretation of the literature as it stands, but I would get our systolic blood pressure less than 120. Again, that's evidence from the Sprint Mind study. So that's one thing I would take home. Again, these factors, diet, exercise, cognitive training, which we'll hear some more from Dr. Mueller, um, vascular risk monitoring, so blood pressure, cholesterol, those things. Um, and then also um, social engagement. So we've heard some about how important it is to hang out with the um, seven dwarves. I think that was the, right, the <laughs> from her picture. And then other things too, getting good sleep. We think that helps our brains get rid of some of the amyloid buildup in our brain. So getting good sleep, treating sleep apnea so we get good oxygen to our brains. We think those factors help improve cognitive function. And then also joining a clinical trial. So again, 
this is my, my call, is that we can't study this without us all working together. I think a lot of you are here because you're part of studies, and so I really want to thank you for that, because this is how we get answers and how we get new medications on our slides and, and not have them be 15 years old. These are, study, these are resources you can seek out. We have a lot of team members who are here who can get you signed up for studies if you're interested. But the other thing, too, is for your own benefit, one website I'd recommend is Owls Forum. If you want to keep up with what's the latest news, what are the, you know, I read about this in the newspaper, or I saw this on the news, um, how can I find out more about that study drug? Owls Forum um, puts out news releases and kind of summarizes the study, so that's a nice source to go to. And some of these other ones, again, um, other resources here on this slide can also help you interpret what the data is out there. So with that, I will stop and let Bucky Badger thank you for us. <laughs>